I keep, you think after two and a half years on Zoom, I will learn how to unmute myself while speaking, but that's not going to happen apparently. But welcome back. We're going to get now into the content, our introduction to NVC. So I have some slides to share. And I just want to say that this is meant to be a co-created space, so your questions are welcome. Please feel free to um, interrupt, raise your hand uh, during the presentation if you um, have a clarifying question. Um, so let's begin. Yeah. So when we're talking about nonviolent communication, um, the reason why we're talking about it is because it's as a tool and also as a way of being, it helps us to recognize um, uh, ours and the humanity of other people. Um, and it does this through several ways. One is into tapping into this um, sense of universal needs. Um, so uh, one of the holdings within nonviolent communication is that um, that um, all human beings have a share um, a set of, of needs. It also is uh, supportive in helping us to transform our judgments and stories into needs. So oftentimes we communicate um, at a level that um, means that we're sharing stories and in some way um, kind of competing to be heard. And so what nonviolent communication can potentially do is to help us to surface what's meaningful um, in those sharing so we can get to a place of being able to exchange uh, from a sense of what's meaningful from all from the parties that are involved. NVC also helps us to bring helps to bring us into a sense of curiosity. So there's a way of gently gently inquiring. Um, not only with others, but also with ourselves. Um, when we find ourselves in a, um, having some kind of um, reaction or wanting to surface understanding uh, between what's happening with us and, and others who are, um, who are part of our community, part of our family, part of our, our places where that we work. And it, or, it's, uh, it orients us to what matters. And so it does this by centering um, empathy. And so we're going to get into um, what the whole understanding is of, of empathy, bringing in this nonviolent lens. And there are four parts to NVC. And so um, just by show of hands, actually, you show your physical hand. Um, has um, How many of you have had some training or introduction to nonviolent communication, just out of curiosity? OK. Yeah, so there you go. It's quite a few of you. And so you may be familiar with the four parts of NVC. So the first part being um, observations. Um, observations are um, important for helping us to get out of judgment and move to that place of curiosity. There's a couple of ways to hold observations. Oftentimes in traditional NVC, um, you'll hear it described as um, describing the thing that if, as if, if you were watching something on a camera um, so that there would be kind of easy agreement with what's happening. Um, and there's other observations that also sit at the systemic level. So for example, um, an understanding of how a person is impacted by various systems of oppression or identities that are put on them, for example. And then we have highlighted here the feelings and needs. Those are the center of kind of NVC practice. Um, so we name feelings so that we're not overwhelmed um, and that we're less reactive. The benefit of naming feelings, it says name it to tame it, is that when we move from a place of just of, 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 of feelings going, not only being embodied, but also putting language to it, it allows us to work with it. it. It becomes more malleable and it becomes something we can step into greater curiosity about with greater ease. And then needs. With needs, we're trying to reach for understanding and seeing each other's humanity. So this taps into that understanding of the universal, of the universal needs. So trying to understand what's meaningful for ourselves and also for the other, for, for, for others. And then we have requests which are about supporting awareness about what can be different uh, in order to build trust and connection. So that's another place where curiosity comes in. It's a place to investigate um, 
um, what's possible by taking a look at, by through the understanding of the observation feelings and needs. Just want to check to see if there's any clarifying questions or reactions to what's been shared so far. Um, I can't see that many of you, so I invite you to use the raise hand function in, in Zoom if there's anything. Okay. All right, so we'll move forward. I'm not seeing any raised hands. So I want to look at this under, uh, understanding what empathy is. So empathy is about seeking understanding of other people's perspectives. It doesn't require us to identify or agree with that perspective. Um, and it helps us to move with a sense of togetherness when we're connecting or we're collaborating. Um, it also helps us to contribute to a person's experience of being seen and it can foster belonging. So I think one of the things that's really important about empathy, and we're gonna take a look at another definition soon is that oftentimes it gets confused with sympathy, which is about identifying with what a person is sharing. Empathy doesn't require us to identify with it, but what we're trying to surface when we're in conversations that are connecting conversations where we're trying to maintain or foster growth in relationship or understanding is understanding. So I'm wanting to have a sense of what's important to this person that I'm in dialogue with. And we're sharing also too, um, a definition or an understanding of what has been named radical empathy that comes from Isabel Wilkerson's wonderful book, Cast. Um, and radical empathy is defined as radical empathy, on the other hand, means putting in the work to educate oneself and to listen with a humble heart to understand another's experience from their perspective, not as we imagine we would feel. Radical empathy is not about you and what you think you would do in a situation you have never been in or perhaps never will. It is a kindred connection from a place of deep knowing that opens your spirit to the pain of another as they perceive it. So what I appreciate about this definition of empathy is that it does very much roll into one, it, 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 it affirms this understanding that it's, that it's about understanding. Um, and also what I'm hoping that you are getting from looking at this definition of empathy is that um, it's something that is possible without, uh, even if our lived experience um, is quite different because where it's about seeking understanding about what's happening and what's meaningful for the other person which we kind of hold as being um, very important when we're looking at trying to create more connection, trying to step towards creating a world that works for more and more people. Just want to pause there again to see if there's any clarifying questions or reactions to what's been shared. Really inviting, um, yeah, inviting anyone to, name, to lend, lend their voice into our collective learning. Okay, thank you, uh, Elis. Welcoming your voice. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, just express gratitude for that reminder. I mean, I've heard definitions of empathy for, and I understand it, but it's still that sense of like we don't need to understand. And I feel like there's such a, um, I would almost call it a compulsion for us to be like, let me understand what you're going through when it's just so irrelevant to being present with somebody. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Like, what well, we want to understand what is important for that person, but we don't have to identify with it. You know, one of the greatest examples of this that I've I've heard uh, speaking spoken of, and I that I often raise is um, trying to um, the like. Uh, an empathic understanding of someone like Donald Trump. Um, you know, I am not a person that thinks it was like, okay, that he was ever a president of the United States. I agree with nothing in terms of his policies, 
But when I see a grown man needs to, needs to tweet every three minutes, I know I can, I can understand that that is a trauma response. I can understand that that is a person who is seeking belonging. I can understand that that is a person who has had an experience of not being seen. It doesn't make, for me anyway, uh, his policy is okay, but I can have an understanding, uh, an empathic understanding of some of the things that feed um, that type of behavior. And so this is where when we think we think back to the description of radical empathy from Isabel Wilkerson, is that for us to have a uh, to move towards communities, families, relationships, where we're deepening our ability to see people for their full humanity, we don't have to connect with the, what a person um, connect with or identify with, um, what a person's um, uh, identity is. We don't have to mirror them, but we can have a place of understanding so that we know um, um, or have greater clarity about what are feeding the choices that they are making. And then we can start to engage in conversations about strategies that are looking at different ways, different tactics to meet those needs that perhaps will support us to have a greater sense of relationship or belonging if we just so desire. So when we think about um, things like addressing the impact of racism and other forms of oppression, you don't have to be in a space of understanding everything about that form of oppression but we can be in a place of practice about understanding what's meaningful about a person's experience by being curious, asking them, and checking to see if we have a shared understanding or, if, or, or even checking in on shared language. So that's the invitation when, we, when we're talking about empathy through an NVC lens. So thank you so much for that. Anyone else before I go back to slides? Again, I invite you to, uh, to raise your hand if you have any questions in the meantime. So we stopped with our uh, um, sharing radical empathy. And so I want to now go into this place of thinking about creating space for a full humanity. So one of the tools within nonviolent communication is um, is self-empathy. So it's a, an application of empathy towards the self. The benefit or what's, what's possible with self-empathy is that it allows us to step towards vulnerability and, and a fuller understanding and acknowledgement of our humanity. So for example, one of the ways that self-empathy has supported me is that um, when I find myself in a place of being reactionary, there, this is a gentle practice for me to step towards understanding where that's coming from. So what, what feelings are up and what needs are up so that I can decide if I want to attend to it in partnership with the person I'm in dialogue with or perhaps find community um, to attend to it or perhaps I can resource myself to attend to it. So we're connecting with our humanity and we're tapping into that, 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 un, that set of universal needs. And what's really also, what's really important about some of these tools is that um, in recognition of dominant, dominant systems, so much of our ability to tap into and understand ourselves has been stripped by things like the impact of white supremacist culture, by things like professionalism, by conflict avoidance and other oppressive systems that other people, and they distract us from what would bring us together. So what that looks like is, for example, is most people who are in a workplace, a traditional workplace, um, there are places that don't, wake up, that don't welcome feelings, for example, that have, where there are rules, um, that are considered standards that have been fed from the dominant culture about what is acceptable behavior. And so this impacts and can stop us from tapping into our own wisdom 
to be able to name what's up and important for us. So the self-empathy process is a way to bring us back to what's essential to kind of foster that sense of belonging, um, which we hold as being the most important human need. And so with empathy, empathy is, uh, so self-empathy, we turn inward. Empathy is what we, um, when we turn our attention to what's happening for others. And so with empathy, the invitation is, is around to have curiosity about what might be meaningful for the other person, and then to affirm those guesses through connection. With empathy, we can move out of right wrong thinking um, because we have a better understanding of what else is present. It moves us beyond the kind of storytelling and narratives that kind of limits our views. Um, so this can come from example, um, our own like lived experience might mean that if we see if we see a certain set of behaviors, if we, if, if we were to see them again, that we could go into, for example, a narrative or storytelling about what that means. When we look at empathy, we want to start to make guesses about what that might mean for the other people that are involved. So we go beyond our storytelling. So we're trying to, as, we, as it was mentioned before, have an understanding of what's meaningful for other people. Um, and, we're in, and we were, are recognizing that we are habituated to blame, shame, and right, wrong thinking. So with empathy and self-empathy, what's important here is that we're not in a place of judgment about things like blame and shame. We're in a place of acceptance around blame and shame because these are responses and reactions that happen to brains and bodies. It's, it's, it's how we are built. We make room for that reality. And then through empathy, we're able to work through to work with that to get to a place of shared understanding. So we're invited through nonviolence for to have meaningful exchanges and understanding of needs. And as we start to understand needs, including the roles that we and others hold that are contributing to disconnection and disrupt shared understanding. So this is also important too from a lens of say anti-racism and anti-oppression. So I've mentioned before something like white supremacist culture. In recognition of white supremacist culture, it's not just those who, who identify or are or, 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 or white identified, but within white, so something like white supremacist culture, we all have roles in it. And so we start to understand these systems and these roles that it helps us to um, understand where some of the points of disconnection will be, uh, some of the points of disconnection are, um, and how we can move towards having a greater um, understanding and collaboration um, amongst ourselves. So again, I'm gonna pause to check in. Um, I know it's a lot of information rather quickly, but um, but inviting your voice. So it looks like there's a raised hand from Elle. So welcoming your voice, Elle. Hi, thanks so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I was wondering, if there is any practical difference between self-empathy and self-awareness or self-knowing, um, or if they're synonymous or if I'm being pedantic. No, I, I think that um, there is a lot of similarities between self-empathy and self-awareness. I think within a nonviolent communication practice, there is a lot of, um, we give a lot of weight to language. Um, and so that is one way that it's different is that what we're inviting is the languaging of a gut feeling or a gut sense of oneself. So that's one of the key differences. I'm wondering if that's helpful to hear at all, L. Yes, yeah, so to my understanding, the way that I kind of, I'm integrating that is that self-awareness sort of has a intellectualizing flavor to it as a term, mm -hmm. whereas self-empathy is really about maybe not even necessarily language first understanding of what's up for you. Yes. Is that right? Exactly it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Okay. And we have a question from Nan. Welcoming your voice. 
Thank you, Leonie. Um, so I was wondering about um, uh, affirming our guesses through connection. And does that mean, like, I just would like you to expand on what you mean by connection, if you. Please. Yeah. So there's a couple of like practical tools around connection. So one of the things that you often um, hear about with nonviolent communication is that we make what's called connection requests, um, which is our way of checking in with our guesses. So for example, um, if I were to name for somebody a guess that, you know, as a result of a particular incident, that they're wanting to have a greater sense of support for example, a, a, a connection would a way of fostering connection or realizing connection is to ask a is to ask a question around uh, is to pose that as a question rather to have them affirm that yes support is something that I would that that, that I would have wanted in that situation. I'm wondering if that's sufficiently clear and as an example. Sorry. Uh, yes, that that's clear. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, and Becky, we're welcoming your voice. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how we know when we're accepting, like accepting blame and shame. Like, what does that look like in practice? Yeah. So, the it can it can vary in a lot of different ways. Sometimes we know through our body. So some people they actually feel flushed. We can know from other behaviors such as. We might notice like um, people speaking more quickly or speaking more slowly. Um, also things like, like eye contact. Um, and so in those moments, rather than naming it as um, I'm feeling blame or shame or um, what blame and shame point to is that there's a need that needs to be named and realized. And so that's where the dialogue either through self-empathy or or with others through empathy is important. So we can put um, put some language towards what that feeling might be. Is that helpful to hear? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And so we're actually gonna invite some practice into some of the things that we've talked about. And I'm gonna invite us to turn our attention to Catherine who will lead us uh, into what's next. Thank you everyone. Awesome, thank you, Leone. That was beautiful. Um, Leone, I'm wondering if you're willing to share a screen to show the slide. So we're gonna take a few minutes now, um, give you a chance to do a little journaling. And the invitation is to journal about a scenario that's had a negative impact on you. Um, and, and importantly, to pick something that's not supercharged. Um, because we're going to then break into pairs and you're going to share this with your partner and that partner is going to practice empathy, supporting you with empathy. So we're going to take three minutes right now, give you a chance to journal and reflect on some event scenario that's happened recently that's had a negative impact on you. And then uh, when we come back, Leonie and I will do a little demonstration of what we're looking for in the breakouts and then we'll move into breakout room. See you in three minutes.
I'm going to call you gently back into our space together. Hopefully that's given you enough time to find a scenario that you want to work with. And uh, Luis is going to drop into the chat links to the needs inventory and feelings inventory from the Center for Nonviolent Communication. Um, we also sent them with in the link for this session. And we're going to use those to practice empathy. So Leon, can you put up the next slide? Or, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, again, my Zoom skills fail me. There we go. Oops, wrong way. Okay, here we go. Oops. Okay. Great. I think it's staying now. Thank you. So, um, so we'll do a quick demo. Uh, Leonie, are you willing to share the your a scenario? Sure. And I will. Yeah. And just before we, Leonie and I start, I just want to mention that we're going to be using. Um, a phrase, a particular phrase when we're offering empathy in our breakouts. And I'm gonna model that phrase in our demonstration. And it's, um, are you feeling, and then name a feeling, because you need and name a need. And this is why we want you to have access to the feelings and needs list. And I, we recognize that this is, can be clunky, it can feel awkward and, um, it's really just an opportunity to, it supports recognizing that what we're focused on is feelings and needs and not getting caught up in the narrative of the story. And as we get facility with the model, and some of you may already have it, having learned NBC, the language gets more fluid and you can, you can make it your own. Um, but for this demonstration, we're gonna use that format. Now let's go ahead with your scenario. Okay, so my scenario is that uh, this is when I was working for an organization, and one day I received this email. This was after I'd done a training for a group of managers that I was also part of that group, but I was leading, I led a, a training, um, had something to do with HR, and I received this email that said, one of the managers that said, I don't know why Leonie thinks she's so damn special. Um, my assumption is, is that it's in response to some praise that I received. So that was the situation. And I felt a type of way. <laughs> so I'm curious, were you feeling or are you feeling now as you remember it, just discouraged because you're really needing understanding yeah yeah it definitely was something that um you know took a little bit of the wind out of my sails you know yeah thinking that I had contributed and getting feedback that I was not only not not that getting feedback that was not that <laughs> mm. yeah so are you maybe also feeling hurt because you need care. Yeah, especially the care, the hurt coming from the lack of care piece, because I'm thinking back on it, I was willing to hear if it didn't work, but the how I heard it, that I received basically an email that wasn't meant for me, uh, but was talking about me was uh, made it much, much worse. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For yeah. That. So before we go into breakouts, I just want to make sure that that was that we're clear on what we're going to do. So we're we're going to break you into pairs, and we'll, you'll have about twenty minutes, maybe a couple of minutes less. And the, we'll invite person one to share their scenario in about four or five sentences, while person two listens. 
And then after person one has finished sharing, person two will make empathy guesses using the, the formula that we've shared. And, you know, go, you can go back and forth as the only, and I demonstrated um, while for the 10 minutes or so of the first person's time. And then once we're halfway through, we'll invite you to switch roles. And just notice in your body, like there's two kind of key things. We wanna really make sure that these are guesses and they're framed as guesses because we don't know. And the second piece is for the, for the person sharing to just notice what happens to your body when somebody makes a guess. So we're gonna break you into pairs now. And Luis, can we actually do 18 minutes instead of 20? We're just a little bit behind time. Um, just give me a moment. Matthew, oh, sorry, okay. I should have given you that. Hmm? That's good, that's fine. Thank uh, you. I'm just, just one, oops, one small question. Um, let's see, uh, would you be, uh, I have a, a one single room uh, that is non-BIPOC, is that, would you be willing to, to join that room? Yes, you can put me in that room. Okay, sounds good. All right, then I think I have, uh, well, actually it might not, not be necessary. All right, all right, so everybody has instructions, uh, 18 minutes, here we go. Um, just, do you want me to join a breakout room or no? No, although We're good I now? just, I don't know if Albert has been here during this call. So that might be actually, could I have you join that, that room just to make sure they're okay? And I'm gonna join Vanessa right now. So okay. I can add you to the room with Albert right now. Well, actually, okay. can you add yourself? Um, Al Al Albert's with somebody. Yeah, I think Albert just joined the call. Okay. Okay, so that's why I'm like, I don't know if they might need some help. Okay, well, we'll just wait for them. To, I'm waiting for them to call for help, but yeah, you go ahead and be with Vanessa because she's on her own. Thank you, Louise. I'm gonna pause the recording. So, would love to welcome your voice about what that experience was like, um, how it was to work with the needs and feelings list or whether or not you were able to come up with your own language and if it, um, if anything shifted for you. So I'm wondering who, I'm, I'm inviting someone to share their voice um, who, uh, for a collective learning welcoming anyone's voice to someone who's willing to share. Okay, thank you, Elle, for welcoming your voice. And then we'll go to Erica. Um, it was lovely to share empathetic space and it was very hard mm -hmm. to maintain the script exactly as the script. Mm -hmm. um, I found myself entering into other kinds of empathetic languaging and connection um, because they were more natural for me. Yeah. So you're speaking to a couple of things. One is that it is hard to maintain empathic connection. And I would love to say that that difficulty will escape you at some point that you'll completely get over it at some point, but that's just not true. People are complicated our feelings are complicated and that the format use can also be very difficult because it is not a naturalized way of speaking and so the good news that I have to share on that is that you don't have to use that formula that formula is there to support you almost like a set of training wheels but it's actually much more important and you'll find it actually that it supports deeper connection if you can start to experiment with the idea of naturalizing um that language um, because you'll be more self-connected and that will show up um, when you're in relation with other people. Um, so the, as I said, the format is there kind of like as a, a way to kind of practice and bring into being um, these traits. And the practice part is important because one of the things that I wanna share with you all is that NVC, a commitment to principles of nonviolence, these are things that we are offering because we have recognized its value 
in creating a world that works for more and more people, one that has more care, um, one that is um, acknowledged as humanity. But the truth is, is that it's actually counter narrative to many of the cultures that we live and work in. And so being able to have practice is a, a wonderful way of kind of supporting you in building um, confidence, resilience, um, and other things to strengthen these tools. So hopefully there's some comfort there in knowing that you don't have to stick with the, with the formula as we have shared it. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna welcome your voice, Ellie. Um, thanks. I really <laughs> enjoy that experience. There's two things I wanted to speak to. Um, one was going into it. I was like, okay, I gotta shore myself up because mm. I'm a highly sensitive person. I was curious, like, am I gonna go too deep into empathy? Is it gonna turn into sympathy? Like, how do I, mm -hmm. how do I stand in that space? Um, and the person I partnered with, Rick, used a great word because I, I talked. We talked about it, and he said, uh, you know, he's noticing the need to be detached which was such a healthy reminder, not like unattached, but somehow detached from, um, and then that curiosity place, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then I'll share one more piece of just being, being heard. Um, mm -hmm. I am so grateful when people are feeling into my feelings. I'm not used to people trying to guess my needs or really even just from childhood experiences, you yeah. know, not even caring about my needs. Like that's not even in the room. So when he asked that, I mean, I even knew it was coming. I was like, oh my gosh, I just, yeah. it, it was a totally different, that building of relationality. It was a whole nother angle that, um, mm -hmm. it just was peripheral and it, it was really beautiful. So thank you for that. Mm. I'm so glad that was your experience. And you lift, there's a couple of things that I want to lift up in response to what you've shared, um, which is that the experience of being asked or needs or even for someone to engage in feelings guesses can be both incredibly settling, but also unsettling. Um, and that is because as you mentioned, some, depending on your lived experience um, or even sometimes, um, it can be part of like cultural backgrounds or all kinds of things that inform this. We are not in the practice of being able to name what our needs. You know, we haven't grown up in spaces where being able to name what's important and meaningful for us um, had a place to go. Like, you know, even if you spoke it, who could, who, who was around to receive it. And I also want to bring in the lens too around um, anti-racism and anti-oppression, because this is also true in um, for people who come from marginalized identities. So it could be around race, it could be around um, gender, it could be around disability, it could be around all kinds of different um, marginalized identities, is that oftentimes, because you are in a dominant culture, you know, that's heteronormative, you know, ableist, etc., cetera, um, you are really out of practice of having anyone um, ask you what your needs are. Because as I mentioned before, many things that are in the dominant culture are seen as standard and normative. And so therefore people, it wouldn't occur to people to um, even guess that um, the, the, that the normative way that they have of, that, that, that they have of doing things and that society has of doing things leaves you out. Um, and so this is where um, this is uh, an important um, thing to remember is that once we get clear about what our needs are, um, it is can be extremely helpful in being able to articulate those needs into the request piece. Um, so that's the value of being clear. Um, we are, as I said, we are, this is counter narrative. And so sometimes it will mean that we will have to make requests around our needs because it won't occur to anybody else to assume that our needs are not being met. And so this helps us to kind of get clear, not only language, but the process of self empathy. And empathy also allows us to settle our bodies so that we can resource ourselves to make those types of requests and make, and make room. 
we, this is part of making the world work for more people is to make room for ourselves in the world so people can see um, and have an understanding of an expanded set of needs. So thank you so much for naming that. Okay, and would love to welcome the voice of, of at least one other person um, who would be, who'd be willing to share what that experience was like for them. Okay, welcoming your voice, Dean. Um, first, I'd like to thank Judy. It was it was a wonderful pleasure to have the interaction and communication. Um, and, and let's see, what can I what can I get through? It's I realized for me, when I'm not heard, and this is an issue in in groups like this. I I really appreciate this group because we're listening to each other. But sometimes I'm in groups where where it's all like a dharma that just comes at you and there's no mm -hmm. you're not seen you're not heard mm -hmm. and and the more i identify my needs the easier it is for me to go oh i know what's going on this is what i want and it's not here this isn't the structure of this particular group and i'm getting better at going well that's why and i guess i realize when i don't identify it the energy goes up into criticalness and judgmentalness and i'll start you know, writing some scenarios, what's wrong with, there's nothing wrong. This just is what they're doing. And I'm mm -hmm. responsible to meet my needs and to figure out, well, is it here? Is it there? You know, where can I? Yeah. And hopefully as we find ourselves in communities, you know, that we not only hold ourselves responsible that we, but we find ourselves or can make requests of communities to join us in having shared responsibility and being open to our particular set of needs or to a wider understanding of needs as well. You know, it's very common in, in Western cultures for things to come to come at things from like an individual lens. Um, and when we bring an individual lens to something like the holding of needs and we're in community, it can lead to something like competition, like NVC in and of itself, it, it can be weaponized. I, I have seen it. Um, and so one of the ways that it's weaponized is that um, the interdependence is lost or we don't open ourselves to that reality. So thank you so much for naming that. And I'm seeing um, from um, AD um, to address um, why some folks find NVC needs to be framed from a decolonizing lens. And there's a link to um, um, our good friend, Menachi, <laughs> um, who was with us both, actually, both Catherine and I in Vancouver last May to celebrate my birthday. Um, <laughs> um, and this is an important piece. It's, it's why we have as, um, as necessary trouble collective as Catherine and I, this is also true with, with what's happening with East Point. Um, we we don't we, we don't share not NVC in just a traditional way. The um, the value the reason why um, NVC is more is valuable with a decolonizing lens is because it makes room for the realities of more and more people. It invites um, a kind of uh, questioning as to what is standard and normative. It is also a way for us to be able with uh, a decolonized or an anti-racist, anti-oppressive lens on, on NVC. It's a way for us to be able to name the impact of systems um, in how it is that we communicate with, with each other, but also how it is that we see ourselves. So some of you may have heard this from me before, but um, my, my relationship with NVC um, as it stands now has come from the fact that I used NVC tools and continue to use them in my own work around my own decolonization. Um, and what that has meant is that um, when I came to a realization and a reckoning that much of my identity as a black um, Canadian with fa with um, our, my family being from Jamaica, which is a, a place that exists because of enslavement. Um, when I came to the realization of how much colonialism has shaped my world, like I speak English because of colonialism, my name's from colonialism, the land that my family is from 
is not native people of African descent, but, but people who are Native Americans or indigenous or Aboriginal folks. NVC, especially the, the self-empathy tool, was how I was able to get to the place of mourning and grieving that allowed me to crystallize my commitments to showing up more fully in the world. And so this is the benefit of having a decolonized NVC lens. And so while there's lots of practitioners and training available around NVC, if you find people who are interested and are offering this through a decolonized or anti-racist, anti-oppressive lens, and you have a commitment around making the world work for more and more people, I invite you to find those people to be your teachers and your mentors and to find community there. Um, and also to contribute to community when it's not working for you. <laughs> um, maybe it's because my organization is called Necessary Trouble Collective, but I'm not about the status quo. And I think it's great if we can start to shape things in a way that makes room for more and more people in their experience. So thank you so much for the questions. And um, um, there's some more um, information from AD about Menashe, who I also invite you to connect with. Um, and, and for now, I'm going to turn our attention to uh, invite to turn our attention to Catherine. Over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Leonie. Thank you all for your incredible questions.